So, so as the MC said, I, I am a self-described uh, uh, gaming nerd and very proud of that tag. So please, you know, feel free to, you know, you see me say, hey, Dr. Nerd, you know, something like that, right? Um, but I want to talk to you today a little bit about what I think video games can kind of do for the future. So a little bit about how I got into this. So I started off actually as a, uh, a science teacher. And as you can imagine, you know, I was kind of sitting there as a science teacher thinking, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so I kind of enrolled into a master's program and a PhD program. And as I went through, I, I went to my major advisor and said, hey, I want to study video games. Now imagine, if you could, you're sitting around with a bunch of teachers and you turn around to them and you say, you know what, I want to use video games to teach our students, to teach our kids. Imagine the looks I got. But you know what, <laughs> it, it worked out pretty well for me. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, but what I really want to talk to you about is we, we kind of have two issues here. We have, we have educational issues on one hand, and we have this issue with this, this disease out here called dementia and Alzheimer's. And it, when you first start to think about them, you see them as these kind of two very different things, and what could they possibly have in common with one another? So I think to understand this, we need to talk about kind of where we start from. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are with education now, okay? And so this complex, you know, crazy graph talks, shows us really two things. It shows us what we're doing and what we're not doing, to put it very simply. The bottom boxes, taken from, this is all taken from the Department of Education and Educational Statistics. The bottom box is what we're doing. So if you start to look at it, you say, okay, we're graduating 74% of our students from high school. That's a good thing. We're graduating about 46% of our students from, from universities and colleges. You can debate that a little bit. But then we start to say, okay, what aren't we doing, right? So we look at the top. So we're not graduating 26% of our students. And then we start to look across these three, I guess maybe minor kind of things, reading, writing, and math, right? And the black boxes are a whole lot bigger than the orange boxes. So even though we're graduating 74% of our high school students, right? Good thing. Only about 30% of them are proficient in reading, writing, and math. Now, I'm not a math genius, and I'd, I'd like to believe that I'm at somewhere in proficiency there for math, but that seems like a little bit of a disconnect, right? So that's one of the problems we're having with education. We have this disconnect between setting up the skills that students need K through 12 and putting them out into the world, right? So that's the first problem. Second problem is, what's this disease, Alzheimer's and dementia? Why is it a problem, right? Well, right now, it's about five, five million people have this disease. You look, okay, five million out of 300 million people in the United States. Okay, yeah, you know, we need to work with them, we need to treat them, that's, that's sad, right? But when you start to think that we have this huge bulge in our population called the baby boomers, moving towards that age where Alzheimer's and dementia start to manifest themselves, what does that mean for us in the future? Okay, so we're, we have about 5 million people now, right? That means by about 2050, this number will triple. So imagine what that means from a healthcare point of view. That's millions upon millions of dollars, upwards into the billions of dollars spent on care for, the, for people experiencing these, these diseases, okay? One in three people will die from this disease, and that's right now. And it's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. So again, we have these two problems. We have educational proficiency, right, over here, working with the, the younger people. And we have Alzheimer's and dementia working on the older people, right? So somewhere in the middle, we gotta talk about where they meet. And I think that that's where video games are gonna come into play. So we're gonna talk a little bit about video games and how we can use video games to kind of solve these two seemingly different problems. But before I do that, I want to talk about who plays video games. Because I think a lot of people have this kind of notion that video games are for high school students, for the, for the, or the college student sitting in the basement, playing video games all night, not studying, you know, doing all these things. But that's not the case. So when we start to look, so 58% of Americans play video games. The other 42% are lying. So <laughs> but so we have a, a huge population of people that play video games inside the United States. We look at the age groups. It crosses the age groups. I'm an old man. I'm, I'm 37. So, you know, 
I grew up with the Atari 2600, listening to Duran Duran, and kind of with the mullet and things like that. Half the group's going, who's Duran Duran? The other group's like, why would you listen to that, right? <laughs> so, but we got, you know, so, but we look across the age groups, and we see that it's pretty uniform in who plays. So I play, I still play video games. I, um, I'd love to convince my wife that it was part of my research, but she doesn't buy it. I tried really, really, really hard. <laughs> so, but we do, we have this huge group of people who play video games. All right, so now we're gonna look at males and females, because a lot of people turn around and say, you know, it's only males who play video games, right? But it's not. Now, granted, females don't play as many video games, or as much, or as often, and the same types of video games, but we still have a, a large proportion of women that play video games, so about 45%. So if, you, if any of you have your cell phone out right now, as I see my students doing when I'm teaching class, you know, they're, they're playing Candy Crush and things like that. <laughs> so I'm sure you guys can relate, because you know, I would never have done that when I was in graduate school, but you know, I, I see it with my students. So you know, it crosses gender and it crosses age groups. So now I want to kind of zoom in a little bit. So I'm going to talk about the, you know, the, the high school age group, 9 to 12 high school, maybe undergraduates or so in, in college. So how do they spend their day? You know, believe it or not, most of it is not sleeping. But they do spend about a third of their time sleeping. And, and that's okay, that's, that works out to be about eight hours, just so you guys kind of know. Um, so you know, if, you're, if you're lucky enough as a college student, you know, not during exam time to be able to get enough sleep, you know, about eight hours is about what that works out to be. 15% okay? uh, of their time spent doing other things. You know, at, at the high school level, you're talking about things like clubs and sports and you know, all those little things that you use to get into college, right? In college, you know, that might be getting extra help, you know, spending your time in the learning labs, those kinds of things, because, you know, I, that's what I would do, you know. Again, video game nerd. Um, and then about 29% of the time is spent in school. So, you know, between those three things, that, that covers a significant portion of the day, but that still leaves about a third of the day unaccounted for. So how are students, particularly 9 through 12 students, spending their day? Well, you still get video games about 13%, and you say to yourself, you know what, that's not really that much. But when you tie it to something like social media, so for a lot of students, both at the high school and as you move up into the college, the idea of video game play and, social, and socialization <laughs> kind of become merged. And they end up spending about a third of their day play, you know, playing video games or being on social media. Now that's not saying that they spend that time straight through, right? How many times have you turned to talk to somebody at dinner or something like that and they're on their phone doing this, right? Okay, so, but they're doing things with their social media, with their games. But, and that's kind of how it breaks out. So now you might turn around and say, well, you know what, that's great. You know, that's for a certain group of people that have access to these, uh, to these devices, to laptops, to cell phones, all those things. But when we start to look at the numbers, we know that 95% of people, at least within the United States, have access to some sort of device to get them to the internet, to get them to the games, to get them to do these things. Okay? About 5% of the people don't, and we can, you know, we can argue about why that might be, but this is where, where those pieces are. So that's kind of the big, broad picture of who plays video games and, and where those are. Okay? So what does the future look like? Now I want you to think about something for a second. Think back to high school. Think back even to your class yesterday. Right? You walk in, you sit down at a desk. The professor stands up there, very monotone, talking to you, you know, I teach statistics, here's statistics, this is the mean of the average, you know, blah, 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 right? And after a while it's womp, 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 right? And you guys are just kind of like, I'm gonna play on the phone, right? Now, what, what about what happens when you go home? You go back to your dorm room, your apartment, or if you're a high school student, you go back to your house. What do you have there? You have your phone, you have your computer, you have a TV, you have, your Xbox, your PlayStation, whatever it is. And what do you do? You hop on, you're chatting with your friends as you do your homework, as you play your video game, as you text people, as you're making plans, right? So we go back to school, sitting there, watching what's going on at the dry erase board with their back like this, you know, right? Versus, and then when you go home. So as, as educators, one of the things that we need to think about is how we're engaging our students in these things. And video games offer an opportunity. We just said, and we know that video games cross kind of all the age groups. We know that video games kind of 
run through every, everything, all the, all the gender, all those types of things. So what if instead of me standing there as a professor lecturing you about you know, what the regression line looks like in this monotone voice, you could come in and you could actually play with the data, or you could walk through a volcano, or you could you know, fight the next zombie apocalypse and actually learn about the viruses that may cause those types of things. What if we could do that instead? And on top of that, what I can do and what that allows me to do gives me, gives me some data to work with, right? So if we look at what video games play, people worldwide play, play about three billion hours of video games a year, right? So think about that for a minute. If we tap a third of that, one billion hours for learning and treatment of medical conditions, we have a lot, a lot of room to work with here, right? So the question is, how do we do this? And what's the link? We want to understand learning, right? So learning, from a very simplistic point of view, is building up connections between neurons, building up connections between things. Dementia, on the other hand, is kind of the exact opposite. It's when they break apart, when they die. So as we start to get a picture of how one works, the build up, right? And we understand how we're building those pieces up. We start to get a picture of what's happening when they break down and how those pieces come apart, right? And so we can help using, using these video games, we can help to kind of change the dynamic a little bit of how these things are happening. So what do we do? So what I do is I sit around, you know, and I'm lucky, I get the chance, I get to build models. But to build models, we need, we need data, right? So where do I get my data from? That's a great question. So I want you guys to think about this. How many of you guys use a, a debit card? I use a debit card on a fairly regular basis, right? Okay. I want to give you uh, one of the major companies there, there's a little logo on the, on the bottom of your debit card there, processes, and I want you to think about this for a second, 3 billion transactions an hour from debit cards or credit cards, okay? And what kind of information is contained in there? Well, what I bought, where I bought it, when I bought it, how much I bought, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on, right? So these credit card companies, Google, or if you're doing searches, has all this information about you, right? And they use that information to make decisions about things. What if, what if, just for a second, I could have you sit down at a desk and play a video game, a video game designed around specific content, or designed around to, to exercise sy different systems or components of what you do cognitively? And I could collect that information, collect everything about what you're doing, what you're, what you're kind of processing, the process, the pathway you go through as you answer these questions, as you solve these problems. That gives me some data, some work to build up a model, to, get, to give me a little bit of information about the, wor the work that I've done. You know, I had about 500 students play a video game for a few hours, and I walked away with about 400,000 data points. So that's just a couple hours of work. Now, from a researcher point of view, that's like a gold mine. You know, I mean, a few hours, 400,000 data points. Now, granted, not all of it's usable and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, you get this wealth of knowledge. And from, that, from that, those data points, I start to build these kind of cognitive maps of what students are thinking about, these tasks that they complete in the video games. Tell me a lot about what kinds of mental processes these students are using as they complete the video game. And from those mental processes, the data, I build a nice model using machine learning or using artificial neural networks. And from those artificial neural networks, I can now run tests on them. Because, you know, I can't walk into a classroom and lesion some, a student's brain. Sometimes I'd like to, but, you know, <laughs> can't really do that. But, you know, with the artificial network, this artificial computer construct, I can start to take it apart. And I can start to look at what builds up the network and what tears down the network. And so the way I do that is through these immersive video games. So, again, these, these really super realistic video games. You know, think of it as a, you know, you guys have probably seen the game Halo, right? It's a first person shooter game. You know, you walk around and you shoot little monsters and all this kind of thing. What if I could make that first person game where you play a scientist? You walk into the lab, right? And you have to remember to put on your gloves and you have to get the Eppendorf tube and you have to get the pipette tip and pipette everything in there. And then you have to put it into the centrifuge. And you know what? Most of the high school students, when they do this, forget to balance the centrifuge. And the game's great. It starts to knock around, falls off the thing, and blows up, and they got to start the whole experiment over. Talk about real life learning, right? If you get to balance the centrifuge in real life, that's a miserable time for you. 
So they go through and they have to go back through and balance it, do all of these things, and we, we teach them science content this way. Now, on the flip side, what if we're dealing with someone who's starting to show signs of dementia, right? We have them walk through these three-dimensional environments doing everyday tasks, things like answering the telephone, working with family members, all those kinds of things to help them build these connections and maintain these connections that they already have. So these 3D immersive video games, these serious games, provide a means for us to do that. And that is the future of what we're doing in education. That is the future of, the, of some of the future of what we're going to be doing in medical sciences as we build these bridges between these disciplines. I work with not just me in the College of Education as a science educator, but I work with a, a neuropsychologist here on campus, Maureen Edgecombe, does some great work working in, with dementia and aging. I work with Lennon Netta at another university looking at general educational psychology. I do measurement work. So it's very transdisciplinary. I'm building their field, they're building my field. So all of these pieces, and all of it's done through video games. Video games aren't just, you know, let's stop the next zombie apocalypse. They are actually tools for us to use in the future. And I'd like to thank you guys very much for the opportunity to talk to you today.